Good afternoon. Okay, well, let's start off by standing up. Stand up, yeah, that's, this is my uh, go-to move, after lunch especially. So I want you to all put your hands out in front of you like that, pull them back hard, bend down and touch the floor. Or if you, your seat, if that's all you can do here. Do it again, pull them back, bend down and touch the floor. Now you can say CFD, CFD and touch the floor. <laughs> Center for Discovery, touch the floor. Center for Discovery, touch the floor. No, you can just go boom. You know, you can, did you, yeah. Boom, yeah, like that, you know, touch the floor. Come on, let's do a few more. Okay, okay. Now that's so you pay attention to my talk. Because I'm gonna talk about exercise and its effect on the brain. Uh, and so we'll go. Now I go back to the Greeks. Last night we were fetid. Turn off those lights. Too much lights? Ah, uh, technical problem. There we go. There we go. There we go. Okay. Starting off with Plato. Uh, the Greeks. Last night we were fetid by. Maria Loy, who's a, a Greek chef, and she was saying, all good things come from Greece. And the Greeks taught the Italians how to cook, and Cesare was a little protesting that, but uh, it, it's important because the Greeks really are our forefathers and foremothers. Uh, so they w particularly f tuned in to the fact that we are not just brains or selves detached from our body. Uh, and this quote from Plato <clears throat> is, is so important, that both our thinking, education, as well as our bodies need to be in tune to reach the highest level that we can. So I've always been interested in exercise and <clears throat> its effect on the brain and the effect on mood, on anxiety, on stress, and on attention. Uh, and as a psychiatrist, this is crucial and important. And uh, so I was following the literature of exercise in the brain uh, really throughout my career. And all of a sudden, uh, there was a big uptick in the mid-90s <clears throat> because um, uh, one of the scientists who put together the, uh, a big MacArthur study looking at how do we prevent Alzheimer's disease? And he came, they came up with three, three factors, three lifestyle changes that actually helped you not get a cognitive decline in Alzheimer's disease. And they were ideal weight, continuous learning, and exercise. Now, we've known about the first two for a long time. But the third one was a bit uh, squirrely because even when they corrected for exercise's positive effect on the cardiovascular system, lessening stroke risk, improving cardiovascular function and all that, exercise was still the most potent lifestyle change you could make to keep your brain going. So one of the scientists of the group, Carl Kottman, went back to his lab in UC Irvine and decided he's going to study what's going on. So he got a bunch of mice. And he gave them the mice SATs <laughs> and taught them how to run in these running wheels and had them run in these running wheels uh, from, from 7 to 14 days, retested them, and their scores went up 25%. And that was pretty amazing. So he did it again and again and again, and, but he also was able to do uh, a couple of things. One is he measured their level of this new fangled uh, brain factor, growth factor, that we had known about for about 10 years before he began his studies, BDNF, brain-derived neurotropic factor. And he found that the BDNF was 200 <coughs> times, or, or yeah, it went up 200% uh, over what it had been at the beginning, uh, before they began to run. And one of the things that they found was that the mice 
like to run. In fact, they were running almost a lot during the night because they're nocturnal animals. They were running four kilometers a night, which is a long way for those little legs to go. Four kilometers a night because they liked it. And so th this led to uh, then uh, him looking at their brains. That's why they did mice, right? He looked at their brains and their brains on the cortex, the top part of the brains, they were thicker. He weighed the brains and the brains were heavier. He looked inside their brains and there was one particular area called the hippocampus, which is a center for learning and memory, which was bigger than, it, than the control mice that weren't running in comparison. So this led to this paper in Nature in 1994, and from then on, boom, everybody was interested in exercise and its effect on the brain. Be, uh, before uh, <clears throat> this study, there were maybe a, a 10 to 20 papers a month on exercise in the brain in the medical literature. After that, it was a tsunami. And this is a, an example, of, I mean, a, a chart of how many papers have been written subsequent to that, really. It's escalating and it increases uh, every week because people are really interested, not only for its effect on Alzheimer's disease and preventing and making our brain cells better, but in terms of improving all kinds of human function. Today, uh, instead of seeing 10 papers a month, I get sent over 100 abstracts a week from the National Library of Medicine of new papers that have come out in looking at exercise and its effect on the brain. There are whole neuroscience departments that then became devoted to exercise and its effect on the brain, and there's still a lot of interest, not only in the US, but around the world. And now Asia's caught the scent, and they're really into it as well, such that uh, Mayo Clinics looked at over 1,600 papers. Now this is three years old already, or six years old. Uh, <coughs> looked at uh, over 1,600 papers of, uh, that were out mainly from the mid-'90s till now uh, to look at does exercise make our brains work better? And the overwhelming conclusion was yes. And it keeps them young and perky. It keeps our brains going. And uh, we have all kinds of uh, data. And this summer I spent a lot of time in conferences learning about neuroplasticity and preventing Alzheimer's disease. And they all, uh, there are a bunch of researchers from the East Coast, West Coast, Mid Coast, uh, have their own protocol uh, as to what you need to do uh, to uh, keep your brains healthy and vibrant. And they all start with exercise. You know, the Fitbit, if you don't have one, maybe you should. Uh, get you moving 10,000 steps for sure. Rudy Tanzi's at the uh, Mass General. Uh, but uh, Dale Bredesen from UCLA has a similar kind of protocol. It's basically living right. Exercise, diet, sleep, meditation, continuous learning, uh, and reduce stress by loving. And one of the things that Ned highlighted in his uh, talk on connection, one of the amazing things is how important connection is. How uh, uh, toxic isolation is, so we really need that. And it is especially uh, when we're looking at the brain health. Um, <clears throat> then I stumbled across a, uh, uh, and as, as this paper was, was circulating and I was more interested in it, I started talking about it, there was this uh, frontline uh, deal back in 2003 on this school in Naperville, Illinois, that they, they were highlighting it because they were talking about the obesity epidemic. And so they had on this PE teacher who 20 years before had decided he was going to change up the physical education program at Naperville. And he, they, they had the kids every day for 45 minutes. It was mainly the traditional kind of uh, PE. And he said, my kids aren't getting healthier. They're, they're still stuck. They're, they're getting overweight, 
you know, they're not moving on and getting bitter. So they began to switch their whole uh, paradigm to look at fitness first. Well, this was great. So the reason why he was on is because they, of their 19,000 students in Naperville in District 203, only 3% of them were overweight. The average in the U.S. was 33% of our kids. Plus, two years before this, 99% of the kids took part in what's called the TIMS test, the International Science and Math Test. And they, they took it as a country. All countries take it every three years. Two years ago, we took it. And we came in 19th and 20th, which is usual. They came in as a country. They came in number one in the world in science and number six in math. This got me on an airplane and led to my book, Spark, uh, which uh, is taking me all over the globe. But the big thing that, that exercise does <clears throat> First, it regulates our emotions. It helps reduce stress, reduce anxiety, boost our mood, boost our sense of well-being, and they optimize our cognitive function. They optimize our brains to learn. And we have all kinds of data now streaming in from schools, from uh, test sites, uh, and certainly looking at preventing cognitive decline in Alzheimer's disease. So I went back. And I looked <clears throat> for wisdom from the past, looked at our hunter-gatherers, because you should realize that we are really only 10,000 years away from being hunter-gatherers. It's only 10,000 years we've been off the savannas and the plains, moving around. And those characters moved anywhere from 10 to 14 miles a day. Our genes have not changed that much in 10,000 years, but we have. We've evolved our society, and we need to recapture what we were doing then. That's why the Fitbit, you know, it, that gives us, you know, four or five miles a day, but it still it propels us to be moving because they were moving all the time. No one was training for triathlons. They were moving for, for need. They were foraging. They were swimming. They were lifting. They were sprinting sometimes to get away from the big cats or to go after an antelope. So they were moving all the time, and we need to recapture that. And thankfully, in seeing Google little tour at, at lunch, you've captured it. Um, because our brains evolved during these, uh, uh, when we were hunter-gatherers, during those four to, four to eight million years when we were hunter-gatherers, our big brains evolved. And where they evolved most, uh oh Oh. Where they evolved most is the front part of our brain. That's the part that grew. This is the motor cortex here. And what, uh, what it grew to, what, what we did is we added on brain parts to help us be better movers, to help us be the best movers, so we could be the evolutionary victors, which we are. Uh, and so that is something that, that, that we, we learn to plan, to imagine, to remember, to sort, to uh, evaluate consequences. All that happened so we, be the, we could become the best movers and pass our genes on to the next generation. So one of your own here at NYU, Rudolfo Linnaeus, wrote in a great book in 2001, that which we call thinking is the evolutionary internalization of movement. Because what happened as we grew bigger uh, tribes, as we added language, we began to use this new parts of the brain that were all about movement and all about making ourselves uh, the, the victors. We used that part, part of the brain to think with so that every time we move, we are activating our thinking brain cells. That's why. Here at Google, and uh, it's a long walk to get anywhere, which is great. Uh, but uh, uh, why Richard Branson has no chairs in his new building and has walking meetings? Uh, because he wants people up and moving. Uh, and you get more out of it because as our brains evolved, we added on all these different brain cells. 
And when we move, we are activating more brain cells than in any other human activity. We are activating them. We're getting them to work. And what we learned uh, 15 years ago is that the brain acts like a muscle. The more we use it, the better it gets. And uh, so uh, also, we know that uh, back in 300 BC, uh, one of our first medical textbooks written by Hippocrates, 300 BC, he said, if somebody comes in with a bad mood, I tell them to go for a walk. If they come back and they still have a bad mood, go walk again. Uh, because this was the magic that he saw and he knew. But we, we know, but it's sort of passe, one of these lifestyle changes. Uh, we, that's not going to cure a depression. That's not going to make us better. However, uh, we've sort of relearned this uh, from actually the cardiologists. Paul Dudley White at Harvard uh, in the 60s and 70s was a big advocate of exercise. And he's a cardiologist. He said, get moving. Uh, he said, a vigorous five mile uh, walk will do more for your mood than, in it, than any other things that we could do. Also at Duke University, they were interested in cardiac rehabilitation. And they started their cardiac patients on treadmills. And they were observing them. And the psych department said, oh my god, they're changing type A personality into type B personality by having them move, by having them exercise on a regular basis. So they were decreasing stress, decreasing anxiety, uh, and improving their mood, such that there then came a whole raft of papers out of Duke looking at uh, exercise as a treatment for depression. And followed, uh, finally, in, in 1999, there was a double-blind study that was done looking at about 100 patients who came into Duke over a three-year period who were depressed. They put them into three different categories. One group, they were all sedentary to begin with. One group, they started exercising three times a week for 40 minutes. Another group, they gave increasing doses of Zoloft, one of our antidepressants. Another group, they did both. After uh, four months, after really four weeks, what they found is that all groups improved and proved to being undepressed. Well, this got a lot of interest and a lot of uh, news time for about three days, which is a news cycle, right? Uh, and uh, then everybody completely forgot about it. But it was a big deal. Exercise was as good as our antidepressants. And of course, it was criticized by the big pharma and its people because they said, oh, you didn't have a placebo group. So the same team uh, from Duke went back 10 years later uh, and did a bigger study looking at 240 or so people who came in with the same complaint, mild to, mild to moderate depression. And they say, submit, put them into four different groups, the three that I showed you, Zoloft, Zoloft and exercise and exercise alone as well as a placebo group. And what they found is that all the interventions worked about the same to decrease their depression except placebo. Placebo have, had some effect, which it always does. But uh, it was clear that exercise was as good as our antidepressants to treat depression. Uh, and then we uh, knew from. The marathon, Boston Marathon, we began to study people who were marathoning and, and tried to measure what was different. What, what, why, why were they able to get through and run up that heartbreak hill uh, and not feel the pain? Well, it became very popular in the early 80s because to, to talk about the endorphins. Many of you probably have heard, if you exercise, you'll raise your endorphins. People still have that phrase in their mind because we measured the, the uh, uh, people coming out of the marathon and their endorphins were sky high. However, we found that that's not really the story. That's the only part of the story. Uh, that uh, oh, I was a little ahead of myself. OK, so, uh, so today, are we re re now we see that are we reaching a point where not prescribing physical activity it should be considered patient neglect. And I think that's a, 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 a really good deal. Uh oh, what am I doing here? Okay. 
So what happens when we exercise? What happens right away? Well, we fire more nerve cells. What happens when I'm standing versus sitting? I'm firing more nerve cells because I'm using more muscle, and that means I need more nerve cells activated. So what happens? I, I, I liberate more norepinephrine, dopamine, and serotonin, acetylcholine. But the three big ones are dopamine, norepinephrine, and serotonin, which we in psychiatry have been addicted to since the 60s. We raise those levels. My standing here needs more muscle action, so my, uh, my dopamine and norepinephrine are increased, and my concentration is better as if, uh, uh, if I were sitting. So we raise norepinephrine, we raise dopamine, which is, are the two neurotransmitters that we target with our stimulants to treat attention problems. And it's, it's universal that you, if you exercise, your attention gets better. Now, <clears throat> I have a dog, uh, a Jack Russell, who's, uh, who's very creative. Uh, and when I got this dog, I took him to the vet and the vet said, oh my God, you got a Jack Russell. Start him on Ritalin now. <laughs> because as a breed, they all have ADD. They all have attention deficit disorder. And uh, they're very smart, but they all have ADD. So, but instead of putting on Ritalin, I devised a, 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 an exercise program for him every morning. I'd take him out into the backyard, had three tennis balls. We had a hill in the backyard, and I threw one up. He went running up to get it, grabbed it, brought it down. Wasn't going to drop it because he's a terrier. They do not <laughs> drop things. But then I had two other balls. So another one went up the hill, and he ran after that and dropped the one that he had. Finally, he had to figure it out. And so we had a game for 15 minutes or so. So after that, we come in, and he was able to <laughs> do his work. He was able to do his work. He was able to sit there and type. I hope he gets <laughs> Uh, and, you know, it, it, it makes for a better day, and he's not uh, outrageous or not too much of a pain in the neck. <laughs> However, there are some days when there's no recess, <laughs> and, you know, he gets back to his ADHD ways. Uh, he says, the heck with you, buddy. Um, but, and we know that exercise is one of the great treatments for our ADHD people. It's, uh, it, can, it can be a treatment on its own, uh, or it can be a, a great additive. So <clears throat> also exercise increases our level of serotonin. Uh, so the, the study that we saw with, the, the, with Zoloft, and we increase our, all of these neurotransmitters. As well, we increase our endorphins, which are endogenous morphine. And, and this is what got it labeled such, but we increase the endorphins, but we also increase the endocannabinoids, which we heard about from Josh and others. And we raise both of them to levels that are antidepressant and, and making us feel well and not leading us into the psychoactive territory that uh, THC itself can get. As well, As well, it raises oxytocin. When we exercise, our oxytocin goes up. And oxytocin is the bonding hormone, the love hormone. And so when we're, after a, a, a bout of exercise, we are feeling pretty good. We're feeling pretty loving and actually lovable. And when I talk to uh, schools of, uh, pubescent boys, they love it. They say, oh my God, I want to be lovable, and they want to go running. Uh, so I get them moving, because then they'll be attractive to the females around. Um, as well, when one of the things that we've learned uh, uh, with this whole uh, science of exercise is that not only does it make our brain cells better, but uh, we're, we're adding more brain cells every day in a, a process called neurogenesis, uh, which we discovered in 1999, and that means we make new brain cells. 
Well, nothing causes us to make more new brain cells than exercise. And, uh, but now we're learning what kind of new brain cells we're making. Well, uh, Elizabeth Gould in Princeton, at Princeton was one of the ones who discovered us, discovered the process of neurogenesis, but she's beginning to look and, and, and looked at what kind of new brain cells are we making in our hippocampus? Because that's where we make most of them. And, and they found, she found recently that it was, they, they were brain cells that contain GABA. So, and GABA is the major break, uh, the major inhibitory neurotransmitter. We make more GABA brain cells in our hippocampus, which helps to decrease our level of stress. It works against uh, stress. It, it makes it harder for us to get stressed if we have more GABA circulating there. And it's one of the ways that exercise works on a longer, in a longer term. But all, every time we exercise, we turn on this front part of our brain, which is the part of the brain that, that evolved last. And this part of the brain makes us uh, smarter. This is the part of the brain that we plan with. We determine what we're going to do. We organize. We, we block lower competing uh, urges memories, uh, uh, we, we get better, we maintain our focus, we improve our working memory. All those are factual. We know this happens. So uh, also we know that exercise optimizes learning because it uh, turns on our brain system, our attention system, our memory system, our motivational system. It, it makes our cellular environment that much better to grow, because the way we learn anything is for our brain cells to grow, as well as it's the best promoter of new cell, new brain cell growth. So we began to work with a lot of schools around the country uh, and around the world. And one of the things that we saw, that at what, at when we began to have kids exercise on a daily basis, the first thing we began to see is a decrease in disciplinary problems. Not because they were tired, not because they were worn out, but because their brains were turned on. Their brains were better at putting the brakes on, uh, so they weren't unruly. And we have data in, 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 in many schools, many countries, where we saw that once the kids moved in the morning, that their level of uh, Discipline problems dropped, and these are two centers and uh, two schools in in the inner city. This one in Kansas City, Missouri, where they uh, an elementary school in a very underprivileged area of the, of the city began to have they, they switched around to have exercise every morning for a half hour, and they saw all kinds of nice changes on measurements of their uh, physical health. But also, the, the principal reported, well, there was a 63% drop in disciplinary problems this year. 63%. In uh, Charleston, South Carolina, a similar kind of finding. Only here, it was an 83% drop in disciplinary referrals in the first semester, where they switched up and had exercise first thing in the morning. And with that came an, an improvement in interest an improvement in participation in class, and thus also improvement in grades, an improvement in test scores. And that's what we found. So exercise, we have, all, as I say, many studies showing that exercise turns our brain on. On your left is a, is a QEG summation of 20 students who came in, sat down, had a QEG done, and, and then they went for a 20-minute walk. They came back, had their QEEG measured again, and the, that on the right shows the difference. You can see the difference. The, the, on the left, the right is much more colorful, and colors indicate more activity, more brain activity. Their brains are switched on after 20 minutes of casual walking. Now, we have much data, as I say, come in to sort of support the notion that exercise makes us smarter, makes us better. Uh, the best, perhaps, came in in 2011, 
out of Sweden, where one of the epidemiology researchers looked at a series of uh, 1.2 million boys over a 26-year period who came through high school and uh, then uh, entered military service. And what's important about it is when they were 15 and entered high school, they were all tested. Their aerobic function was tested. Their IQ was tested. Then they retested them when they entered military service when they were 18. They found a correlation between those that improved their aerobic function, that got fitter, had higher IQs than, than they had before, and compared to those kids that didn't improve their aerobic function. And this was all very exciting, but then they also looked at 650 sets of identical twins and saw the same phenomena. That is, the twin that got more fit improved on their academic function uh, and, and, and on their IQ tests, at the, uh, at, again, when they were retested at the age of 18. So I think there's ample evidence around, from around the world, and we're seeing this like daily come in, that exercise promotes uh, not only our sense of well-being and our mood and our anxiety level, but it promotes our ability to, to think and to socialize and to be more social. And at the center, uh, which is imbued with this message, very much seen in, on, on all the houses and all the grounds, you see these kids moving, and they're moving for a purpose, <coughs> to keep moving, to help turn their brains on. And we're seeing a decrease in uh, disruptive behavior, an improvement in socialization, an improvement in learning while they're in this Pre exercise state and post exercise state. So we're, we're seeing an actual tangible difference. So uh, I want you all to continue to move when uh, I'm done here. So uh, thank you. And uh, I, I love being at the center. It's it's terrific place. And my first day there sort of sums it up. I, 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 I came in late in the evening around dusk. And out my back door, I saw two different groups of kids running at night. They were out for a running group. So it, it, it sort of fits with what, I, what we know, what's useful to help our, our kids there and kids around the world and all of us to do better. So thank you.